Now we're going to just get started. Okay, cool. Hi, my name is Kayla Zo, and I'm the co-founder and co-executive director of Make a Statement. So I'll be facilitating and hosting the webinars for today, and I did so the past two days as well. So we'll be going over introductions from both Make a Statement and Breaking Barriers in Tech, which we have Rakaya joining us, who is the founder of Breaking Barriers in Tech. Uh, we also have a lecture with our guest speaker, Maximilian Gotez, and a 10 minute Q&A session at the end. So in the chat box, you'll see that there's a Q&A submission option. So you can ask questions at any time during our presentation, either anonymously or not. And I'll be filtering them out and asking them to um, max during our session at the end. Thank you again for attending and we're super excited to host this workshop. Now, Emily, feel free to introduce our um, organization. Hi guys, um, my name is Emily Han. I'm the other co-founder of Make a Statement. And if you don't know, um, Make a Statement is a worldwide nonprofit that aims to educate youth and international students about public speaking and speech and debate. So far, we've reached 25 states and 14 countries and established international partnerships with, um, it's actually Norway, not UK, and China. Um, so if you want to get involved with our organization, here are some links on the right. Um, you can support us uh, by participating in our ongoing merch fundraiser or um, signing up for our email update list so you can join our future workshops. Um, but yeah, so now I'm going to pass it on to Rikaya, who's the founder of Breaking Barriers in Tech. Okay, cool. Hi, everybody. Um, we actually recently just went through a name change. So we're actually just breaking barriers. Um, but basically, I mean, you can read the screen. We basically are a group that um, kind of breaks the barrier for a lot of women who are trying to get in tech, especially women of color, you know, from low income, as well as, you know, underrepresented communities. Um, I myself very much um, align with what our group does. Um, if you're interested or want to get involved, I don't want to take too much of your time. There are links on the side and I will also be sending in a link later on um, throughout the presentation and you can click it and get involved. But yeah, thank you. Okay, and now we're gonna have our guest speaker, Max, um, talk about um, interview skills and then talk about entrepreneurship. So again, if you have any questions um, throughout the whole presentation, feel free to um, put your question in the Q&A chat box and not um, Q&A box, not the chat box, um, because Q&A box would be easier for us. But yeah, um, take it away, Max. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Max, as, they, as Emily and Kaylin said. I'm going to be a freshman at Georgetown's McNutt School of Business next uh, in the fall. So I'm really looking forward to talking to you today about interview skills. I founded a nonprofit organization uh, which teaches robotics to students in low-income communities. I'll be talking about this a little bit later. But I probably conducted over 100 interviews in the past uh, couple months for new volunteer teachers in all sorts of uh, positions. So I feel pretty comfortable sharing with you what things that I've seen that have worked and things that I've seen that don't work. So. Next slide. So, so in terms of the dress code, it, it really depends on the interview. I think usually in an in-person interview, if you don't specify, I usually like to say you should wear something like semi-formal. Like if you're if you're a man trying to wear like maybe button down shirt, I'm not too familiar with the dress for our females are, but um, you just want to kind of look professional and make a good impression because usually in an interview, the first 30 seconds is the, is the most important. So if you're not dressed properly, it's definitely not, not a good thing. But I think it also depends on, a, on the position. You probably want to look up the company culture to see if they typically wear, you know, suit. Like if you're interviewing for, I don't know, like a lawyer position, you might want to wear a full-blown suit. But if you're going for, I don't know, play, like Google where it's a little bit more casual, that's not as important. So if you don't specify the dress code, I, I think the safe thing is to just go a business casual. That's a, it's always a, a very safe spot to go. And for virtual interviews, it really, it really um, doesn't, it really depends on what the person says. Like for our virtual interviews and our nonprofit organization, we tell people that the dress code is casual. So if you get a note like that, then you know the dress code is casual. So you don't need to do that. But it really just depends on the position that it is and whether or not they're specifying it. But like I said, they don't specify it and just dress for success is what I like to call it. Next slide. So some common interview questions, I think that, it, that are seen across multiple interviews and that I, I see a lot and I think are definitely some, some questions that I answer a lot, ask a lot. 
my first one is tell me about yourself. I know this one's kind of ambiguous. This one's kind of vague, but I think you like to kind of present yourself as kind of a multifaceted person. So I think the best way to answer this question would be to, you know, first share a little bit about some of your experiences that you think would be relevant for whatever position it is. But also people want to see that you're not just a one-sided person, that you're not only into work and everything. So maybe share some of your also hobbies and some of your passions that you have outside of work. That's definitely a good thing to say for the tell me about yourself part here. And next question that's very common is, is what are, how are you, qual why are you qualified for this position? I think you have to be uh, very strategic in listing out your experiences. Throughout the interview, you wanna have a mental bucket list of the different experiences that you wanna say throughout the interview. And you kind of have to put them into each position. So I think for this, for this position, the position is very direct. I, I, I would look up what the position is, some of the, on the position job posting, kind of, whoops. I look up like, can you go back? Yeah, I, I look up, you know, what, what kind of skills would be important for that position and try to target your experiences. And don't just say like your skills, also say like previous experiences like you have. Like you said, I worked at this XYZ volunteer position or I've done this before and that's what makes you qualify for this. So don't just say I'm good at this. It's just kind of something that you say in interviews, you, don't, you show don't tell. What show don't tell means that you don't, you don't tell people directly like, oh, I'm, I'm good at, I'm good at work. You could say you say an experience that shows that you're you're good at that. So that's definitely a very good thing for for interviews. Another thing you can say is uh, another common question is why do you want the position? This is a very very common question. Two big no nos in my book are to say that if it's a volunteer position that you want community service hours, or if it's a paid position you want money. And while that that response might seem like a, a decent response, the problem with that response is that there are a lot of positions where you can gain community service hours. There are a lot of places where you can get money. And to say that response is just very uh, non-unique. And it, I really, it really sets off when, when, when I interview people and I get that response, it shows to me that they don't really, they didn't really take a lot of time to dwell into our position and to see really why they want to do this. So in terms of the best way to, to, to answer this question, I would, I would uh, try to have a personal connection, right? So like, for example, my organization where we teach STEM to low-income communities, I think one of the best responses we usually get was like, I really like STEM. I really like, I really enjoy teaching other people. So this is the perfect opportunity to put me into this position. You wanna think, because I think the issue with this response is that a lot of responses they get could be applied to any other position, any other volunteering position. And that doesn't really show me that the person really wants the position. So your response to this question, you have to think about what are some other jobs that I could take and would my response be the same? And if the answer is yes, if your response is gonna be the same, that's not a good response. You wanna make it unique. You wanna tailor it towards the position that you're applying to. That's very important. And then another very common question is, is what are your strengths and weaknesses? I, I really hate the weaknesses question. I hate, I hate asking it. I hate being asked it during interviews um, on both sides. I, ha I hate asking the question myself and I hate being asked it, but it, it's actually a really important question at the end of the day. Um, my, my general advice would be to pick, pick a weakness that you don't, think will be like detrimental to position like two days ago I had someone who was interviewing for a volunteer position a teaching position they said I'm not very I'm not very good at explaining concepts and to say that for a weakness is really not a good idea because teaching is all about explaining concepts so when I heard that that girl said that her weakness is not being able to explain things people didn't know it that was a, a really big red flag to me most of the times uh, the, the, the safe and cliche overused answer for weaknesses that you're perfectionist I don't recommend going for that question. I don't recommend going for the answer because simply because way too many people have said it and it's just uh, too overused and generic. I recommend picking something for a weakness question that I, I think the, the best responses are things like, you know, um, I try to, I use too many filler words when I talk or kind of things like that, that, that are pretty shared amongst all people and, and won't really be uh, detrimental to you're, you're working with the position. So that, that's kind of what I think. Like you have to find a balance between not being too honest while at the same time providing an answer that will seem reasonable. Otherwise for an interview, it will seem very fake. And that's not a good kind of impression to have. As for your strengths, I think this is kind of similar to the why you're qualified for the position question. You really want to look into kind of the position and kind of quality that you be good for that position. So for example, a response would be, I'm patient with students, or I'm very uh, good at explaining things in multiple ways. 
So responses like that, that really show that really fit for the position. I think that, that's what I really recommend for the strengths question. And then obviously the weaknesses question. I mean, that, 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 that's, I think that's one of the hardest questions to receive as, as in an interview. You just have to come prepared and just say something that won't ruin it, but you're trying to cover up or hide something. And a really bad response question is that this, this, I think everyone here has something there is in the world. So don't just say like, oh, I don't, know, I don't really know much about that subject. That's not a really good answer to that question. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Hello? Can we go to the um, next slide, please? Um, I think you're breaking up a little, but um, I am Can we on the next move slide, to the so next slide? Wanna... Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, I think we're having a little technical um, difficulties, but we'll wait till Max Lock back on, so. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. Um, we're just gonna get in contact with him. Okay, there he is. Hi, can you hear us? My internet froze there. Okay. Okay. Um. I hey, Max, okay. can you hear us? Is it better now? I think it's still bad on your side. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, give me a sec. Let me let me just close some other tabs on my computer. Maybe that's the issue. Okay. Um. Give me one sec. Okay, well, that should be better now. Yeah, we can hear you better now. Okay, yeah. cool. So, um, people who are in, um, who are listening in, can you drop in the chat box, um, starting where, where Max started cutting off, so we can just continue off of there. I think Emily, you can go back to the previous slide, and um, Max can just continue off of talking about strengths. Okay, do you want me to address the last point again? Okay, so the last slide was done, so on to the next slide. Okay, I think my, my, my very last point on this slide was about weaknesses. I think one thing that you do not want to say is that I do not know kind of this, or I don't really know like physics, I don't really know part of this, or I think that's not a really good question unless it's an essential skill for the job, because A, if you're applying for like a web development position and you don't know HTML, that's definitely, then you shouldn't be applying for this in the first place. But if you're applying for a position like web development and you say, oh, I don't know biology, that's not a really good answer because biology is not really important for being a web development position. I think everyone here has something in the world that we don't know. I don't think it's humanly possible to know everything there is in the world. So don't go in and say that there's something that you don't know. That's a really bad, that's a really bad answer. Okay, move on. Okay, some of the things that are essential for interviews, I'd say number one, pretty self-explanatory, be on time. I know sometimes I have interviews back to back and when the first person is late, then it creates a knock on effect for the rest of the day. And that's really not fun for me, nor is it fun for any of the, the next person or anything like that. So be on time. If, if, you, if it is a virtual interview, whatever it is, try to be five minutes early. As we all know, there are technical issues. I just experienced them myself. So it's always good to be uh, five minutes early so you can work out those technical issues. If you're, if it is a, it is, it is in person interview, what I recommend is, 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 is going Google maps, seeing how long it's going to take for you to get there and targeting to be there 15 minutes early. I say 15 minutes because there could be traffic. There could be, it could be hard to find parking. You don't know what can happen and leave a big buffer like that will first make you not rush because if you're, if you're going there, whether you're driving or in your, someone else's car or you're biking, whatever it is, if you're gonna be, if you're in a under time pressure, it's gonna put you into a really rushed mood. And that is not gonna translate into a really good impression when you arrive. Like if you arrive, you're gonna be all like 
you know, panting for your breath or that, that's not a really good impression. So say target being 15 minutes early so you can relax and you can get there. And you can be in a calm mood for the interview to start. Um, number, number two is, is ask questions. Um, leaves a very bad impression when at the end of the interview, in this person has no questions. And I think this kind of goes on to the last point is that if you ask questions, it shows that you're interested in the organization. It shows that you really did more work and did more research because it's pretty obvious when I, when I have someone who comes to interview and I can tell they know nothing about an organization. It's pretty obvious. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not difficult to hide. It's, um, when you, when you, you really have to look into the organization and some questions that if, and if you absolutely cannot come up with, with, with questions, the generic go-to questions would be like, why did you choose to do this position in the company? Or what do you enjoy most about your job? Kind of questions like that, that kind of work on every moment. I don't, I don't recommend asking them over other questions. I recommend trying to do specific questions, but if you need to ask questions like that, just to ask questions for the sake of doing it, please ask questions. Otherwise it shows that you're not, you're not really interested in the position if you don't ask questions. I think, I think an interview is two ways. Yes, the interviewer is gonna be asking you questions, but yes, as the interview, you, I think you also need to ask questions that kind of goes both ways. Seem enthusiastic. That's also something that's not also very easy to tell when you're in an interview, is that if, if you seem bored, if you seem not really into the position, it's, it's so easy to tell. So what I say is, uh, Try to make your smile, make yourself sound happy, sound excited to, uh, for the position. And also prepare, but don't prepare. Don't, don't memorize stuff. Don't memorize answers. It's okay to come up with responses to some things you think they might ask. But if you go in and you're like a robot and you're just repeating off something that you've pre-memorized, it sounds very fake. It doesn't sound very genuine. And believe it or not, it's easy to tell. I can tell, like, especially in the virtual interview where it's easy to like, you know, have a paper next to you or have something else over there and just read it off word for word, word verbatim. That's not, that's not good. And I can, I can tell right away, especially in an interview. If you're in a virtual interview, you can see, you know, they're not looking down at the camera they're looking down. And in, in, in an in-person interview, don't memorize stuff. It, it, it doesn't help you. It really doesn't. Just prepare, prepare some, some things you might want to say, prepare, have a mental bucket list of everything you want to say. But make it impromptu it makes it feel more more relaxed more like a conversation like i'm doing right now i didn't i didn't I, i'm not i'm not reading off a memorized script for this presentation i i, I like little bit of points i prepared for this but i didn't i didn't i'm not reading off a memorized script and that's why that way it sounds more relaxed it sounds more uh more um more genuine more like a genuine conversation because when you talk to your friends you don't read off a script so that's what i like to say is to be um prepare but don't ever prepare and here's a helpful tip. If you get a question and you're like, ooh, I really don't know how to answer this. Instead of just sitting there and having 15, 15 seconds or whatever many seconds of awkward silence, what I like to say is ask for clarification. Just say like, can you say those, can you, say, can you ask a question in, in different words? Even if you understand a question, that's a good way to buy yourself an extra 15 seconds, an extra 10 seconds for you to just think. And I've done this myself multiple times when I was, when I was, at, when I was being interviewed. When I got a question, I said, oh, I really don't know how to answer that. I need more time to think. Just, you don't, even, even if you don't need to ask for a clarification, even if you understand a question, just ask for clarification so that when they're, when they're giving you a clarification for a question, you can spend that time thinking about how you're going to answer it. So that's a very smart tip. Instead of just sitting there with awkward silence, that doesn't really leave a good impression. Obviously, don't do that for every question, but if there's a curveball question and you don't really think you need more time to do it, I highly recommend doing that. Okay, next slide. Okay, what do we look for as an interviewer? I, I, I look for kind of a, a three things. And the first one is qualifications. Obviously, if you're gonna be applying for a teaching position and you don't know what you're gonna teach, that's a big no-no. I think that's definitely one big part of it. But usually most applications are gonna ask you to submit a resume and to submit you know, a, some sort of written application beforehand. And generally, by the time you've gotten an interview, they've already checked off the box for qualifications. In an interview, you're looking for communication skills, you're looking for professionalism. What I mean by communication skills is, is I mean, I, I, know, I know for, I know my, my organization is mainly teaching, so I usually like to think, well, if you're teaching, you're gonna have to communicate a concept about, you're gonna have to like explain a concept. So if you can't really explain yourself to me, that's not a really good sign. And I know in, in, other, organ in other positions, not teaching is especially important to have good communication skills, but to present yourself well and to kind of make yourself have a good good vibe with the interviewer that that's a really that's really important to show that you can you're someone who you can work with and you're someone that you know you can really um work get along together professionalism this is showing up on time 
saying please and thank you, writing a thank you note. That's a really good thing to do. Write a thank you note after interview. Professionalism and like dressing, dressing professionally. I think though that's, that's all really important to leave, leave a good impression. Okay, next slide. Okay, my interviewing pet peeves, being late, like I, like I said before, I really, I, sometimes I have interviews that are scheduled back to back and when one interview is late, then I have to start the next interview late and just leaves a knock on effect for the whole day. And it's just not fun. It's not fun for me. It's not fun for the person. And yeah, I understand some of them are, some of them are genuine reasons why people are late and those are okay. But if you don't have a genuine reason for being late, don't be late. That, that really annoys everyone and, and kind of gets the day um, not, not, not really a, good off to a good start because being late is your first impression if you're late that's the first thing the person's going to think about you oh this person's late you don't really know how to respect my time that's not a good thing another thing i don't like is when someone repeats the same filler phrase over and over again two weeks ago i had someone who interviewed for us and he kept on saying the word what not at the end of every sentence and it drove me crazy it really did and it's not only been what not it's been I don't know. Everyone has their different words that they repeat over and over again. And they know sometimes it's not really uh, something that you're aware of, but it drives, it, it has driven me crazy on multiple occasions. And sometimes I thought to myself, well, if I can't listen to this person for 15 minutes without being crazy, being driven crazy, I don't want to have a student listen to that person for whatever many hours. So do not repeat the same filler phrase over and over again, whatever the filler phrase is, whether it's what not, um, hum, whatever it is, don't, don't do it. Not looking at the interview or a camera. That's also not a really good thing. I had one interview where the person was 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 like this. They're like the camera was on their side, and it seemed like I was listening to a video of someone talking to their computer. It was hilarious for me, but <laughs> it was a uh, not a good impression. So look at the interview. Look at their eyes. If you don't like if you don't like looking at people's eyes, look at their forehead. It's it's same effect for you. Look at the camera. Don't look down at whatever notes you're doing if it's a virtual interview because they, they can tell. I look for eye contact. It's, it's, it's communication. Like I said in the previous slide, communication is a good thing. And then sounding bored and enthusiastic, right? If I come in here and say, oh, I, I want to have this position. I am good at this and that. It's just, it's just not really good impression. That just really shows the person that if you're not excited in a 15-minute interview, how are you going to be excited for the rest of the time you're going to be doing in this job, whether it's a volunteer opportunity or paid opportunity? So... You really want to sound enthusiastic and then not asking questions. That's like I said before, that, that, that's, that's not a good thing. It just shows that you're not really interested. It shows you didn't really do a lot of research in the position and it just shows your overall, you didn't really prepare. That's not a good impression to have. The last thing is sounding arrogant. It, I, I, you, can, you can tell right away when someone says someone sounds arrogant. And I know in an interview you're trying to kind of Put yourself in the best light so kind of find the balance it's okay to say you know i have better than everyone else that makes you sound really really arrogant okay so that's breaking up is it better now okay um it makes you sound really really arrogant and i think i don't i don't think anyone here likes to work with people who are arrogant so do not sound arrogant it's okay to, it's okay to uh put yourself in good light but there's a difference between putting yourself in good light than to uh, say it sound arrogant. Okay, next slide. How to stand out. Uh, the people that, when I look back at my interviews and I think the ones that have gone really, really well, it's people who've done really extensive research, who come into the interview saying, saying like, I, I learned this, this, and that about your organization. And some things are like, wow. Like, I don't even remember putting that on my website. Like that's, those are, those are kind of things that, wow, you can ask unique questions. Ask questions like, I, I know it's better to ask, regular questions and no questions at all but if you're able to come up with unique questions that like really no one else has asked and for a unique question i'd be like i got one time a, a question for our organization like you know um how do you support a gender diversity in your organization and i thought like that's a really smart question to ask so questions like that i think really uh, depending on the company the questions that show that you really had to do a lot of research that's a, that's a good thing. I say this amount many times because sound excited, sound like you really enjoy being there and enjoy interviews. I mean, yes, they're stressful, but at the end of the day, make, make interviews fun. You're, you're there to, you're there to show why you're the best fit for the position and it should be an exciting thing. So sound happy, sound excited, sound like you really want the position. 
And lastly, write a thank you note. I know this is not something that a lot of people have done for me, but every time I get a thank you note, I really like it because it shows that the person is serious. It shows the person really wants the position. It shows that they're very enthusiastic about it. So I think writing a thank you note is a really nice touch to the end of it. Okay. So that's pretty much everything that you've heard from me about um, interview skills. Let's go on to the next topic, which is uh, entrepreneurship. Next slide. Okay, so uh, this is a nonprofit organization that I started, and this, this is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means that we are nationally registered with the uh, internal revenues and I started this organization three years ago when I was a freshman in high school, uh, late freshman in high school. And what we, we offer free STEM classes. Our mission is to provide equitable educational opportunities to students, all students from students from all backgrounds, particularly those in low income communities and students in, in, in classes in STEM. We offer free STEM classes. Before COVID, we had after school classes. We, we went to schools after we went to uh, schools and we went to after school and we taught Lego Mindstorms robots and kind of that kind of stuff. And, Obviously this whole COVID situation has made us really uh, switch and really change what we've been doing. And now, now we have uh, online classes. We teach things like Scratch, Python, and all sorts of things like that. We teach uh, horse offerings for K through eighth graders. And we currently have uh, 250 students right now. So we've had taught in the history seven, 70 plus students and we have uh, 70 current volunteers. That's a little bit about my organization before I go delving into more details about what I think teen entrepreneurship represents. Okay, I think one, one big thing about entrepreneurship is identifying a problem and solving it by starting and creating something new. The, if you're gonna be, if you're gonna be doing the same thing, you're, you're either gonna have to be cheaper or it's gonna have to be better. So those are, those are the two ways that people are gonna want, want to do your product. It's either it's gonna be cheaper or it's gonna be better. And I think, that's definitely kind of what I, what I define entrepreneurship as. I mean, if you look at the dictionary definition of entrepreneurship, it'll be something a lot more generic, but I think it's really about, it doesn't have to be, we, you don't have to start a company to be an entrepreneur. If you come up with a creative like life hack that'll help you get through your day, I would consider that entrepreneurship. It's just about you know identifying a problem and saying, hey, how can I make this better? That's what entrepreneurship is. For me, I saw that the operator's opportunity gap. I saw that there are people who did not have access to the same educational opportunities. And I said, okay, let's do that. What entrepreneurship has meant to me, yeah, I found, I saw a lack of, of STEM extracurricular in low income schools and my solution was robotics for all. That's, 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 that's kind of the problem that I'm, tar I'm targeting and that's kind of what, I, what, what my solution is. Entrepreneurship is a path of self-discovery. I think this is definitely a big thing about this. When, you're, when, when, you, when you start a company, you do everything. You file legal forms, you contact schools, you do cold emailing, you do everything. And you learn a lot about yourself. I think you definitely, because you have to do so many things, because you have to interact with so many people on a daily basis, you definitely, you definitely gain a lot of people skills. You gain a lot of uh, skills that really help you connect and that really uh, make you uh, really feel more in touch and really, really give your work value. So next slide. So for me, my self-discovery path to entrepreneurship. Kittisons is a for-profit organization where I, I, I taught um, Legos. And then in, in ninth grade, I went to Reading Partners, where I was, I was teaching reading in low-income communities. And transitioning from Kittisons, where I, I taught it was a for-profit organization. I taught parents who, who, who could afford to send kids to like $500 summer camps and all sorts of stuff. To go to Reading Partners, which was for low-income students, I really discovered, you know, I really like teaching and I, I really discovered the problem there. So the photo there in the, the bottom right hand corner is me teaching our first class and, 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 and first, that first robotic class. Basically what happened was that I was at reading partners and I thought, you know, I'm teaching reading to these low income students. So I said, if I'm teaching reading, why can't I teach STEM? Why can't I teach robotics? So that's, that's, how, I, that's how this whole thing started. So it started with me teaching just one class at one school. Uh, and that's what the photo in the bottom right cor hand corner is. And I thought, okay, it's me teaching this one class in this one school. The kids are really liking it. I'm really enjoying myself. How do I make this bigger? And I like to think of a company as a vehicle, right? What, what differentiates just a lot of people just teaching others without, without them, it's, it's a lot harder for like, just say anyone here to just say, okay, I want to start teaching these kids something. With a company, all the standards are process, or all, this, all, the, all the processes are standardized and it makes it much easier. A company's a vehicle, it's a vehicle for change. It makes, it makes change faster, it makes it easier, makes it more efficient. So 
Robotics for all is just a vehicle for us to create greater social impact and greater social change. That's just what it is. Next. Okay, this is a big thing. Entrepreneurship is about not being afraid of rejections and failures. On the next slide, you can go. Go to the next slide, please. This is this this is cold emailing to me, right? You you cold email people and you just like that that's just part of the I emailed schools. I emailed a bunch of people and you have to be okay with people saying no. You have to be okay with people saying what you're doing is a waste of your time. Stop doing it. What you're doing is is not is not is not gonna work. But in the end, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're going to, you're going to have to deal with getting rejections. You're going to have to deal with people saying no, you're going to have to deal with all the haters, but as long as there are people who believe in you, as long as there are people who really, really um, believe in your mission, that's all that matters. At the end of the day, as long as you believe what you're doing is right, it doesn't matter what everyone else says. And that's just, that's just part of it. That's just something you're going to have to deal with. If, if you don't like rejections, you can't take rejections. I don't recommend. I don't recommend starting a company. It's just. It's just something that's going to happen. And you, you know, unfortunately, that's just something that is natural. You're going to have people who are not going to respond. Of these emails here, probably I got one response. The rest of them either ghosted me or marked me as spam. But who cares? Who cares? As long as, uh, as long as there are certain people who believe in what you do, that's all. That's all that matters. Okay. Here, here, here are all the emails that I've gotten from from thing. This did not happen. You're not go through, um, but yeah. So this is a an example of all the times you're gonna get rejection, all the times you're gonna get people saying no, and you you just have to accept it. You just have to accept that that's just a part of it, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's not you don't take it personally, but as long as you go on to the next slide, there are people who say yes. That's all that that's all that's important. So that's at the end. I and I, I purposely put 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 less yeses here because I think that that's very reflective of it, especially in the very beginning. You're going to have more people saying no than more people saying yes, and that doesn't matter. Once you're bigger, you can prove them wrong. Okay. And lastly, I think entrepreneurship is about teamwork. There's no way I can, I can run a company on my own. It's completely, I think even in, even in this, uh, in this panel, I think you can see Kaylin and Emily working together, right? I don't think one of them could have done, done it alone. I think it's, it's, it's about, utilizing each other's strengths because no one is good at everything. It's just, it's just a fact, right? I'm not good at everything. No one here is good at everything. So, but you can create a perfect team by putting together strengths that everyone has. So as a team, you are, I, I, I wouldn't even call it perfect. Perfect is, a, is an ambiguous word that doesn't exist. It does, it does not achieve it. I, you can create a dynamic team. You can create a team that has multifaceted strengths. And when you're choosing your business partner, when you're choosing who to work with, I would recommend choosing someone who doesn't have the exact same strengths as you. Because what's the point? What's the point of having some, having two people who both know, who both are really good at the same things and bad at the same things? That doesn't help you. Choose someone who's good at the stuff that you're bad at, and then it'll be good. Okay. Next slide. And here's the, here's the photo at the end of our classes. I, I know I really miss this. I really miss when we could teach in person. I, I, I'm sure all of us miss <laughs> being in a classroom like that. This was, uh, of course, pre-COVID. And you can see in the back line, there's all the volunteers who've been help, helping us. And this was especially the beginning stage of the organization. When it's, it's about teamwork. It's No one can do it alone. And I, I can't take credit for robotics for all, all alone. It, it's been it's in the culmination of dozens of people's work and it's 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 actually incredible to me how 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 talented and, and how uh, amazing all of our volunteers are. They really are instrumental to our success as an organization. I'm I'm just I like to put it here. I I just I just talk all day. The rest, my, my volunteers do our actual work. They actually do our teaching. I'm I'm just here to talk, and <laughs> they're they've been really instrumental to our success. Okay. And then. I think especially, I, I think most people here are teenagers. Teen entrepreneurship is about breaking the stigma about teens. I think there are a lot of people who think, oh, you're going to do this college, you're going to do this project just for getting into college admissions. And, oh, you're not capable of that. Or, oh, teenagers are, are sporadic. They're not very responsible. There's all, there's all those kind of stereotypes. And I think that's what makes teen entrepreneurship particularly harder is because everyone's trying to go against you. Everyone's trying to prove you wrong. Everyone's trying to think that, oh, you're not capable of doing that. You have to break that stigma. You have to you have to prove to people that you are stronger, that you are um, cap more capable. Because, and I know it's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. And I, I personally felt that now that I just graduated from high school, all of a sudden it's gotten a lot easier. 
but it's 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 but but I think that's one of the what's one of the best things about starting a company when you when you when you when you're a teenager when you're high school is that you can really um prove other people wrong you can really uh do a good job and you can really uh, break the stigma about teen entrepreneurship that's what I really think is is, is a great thing about it so next slide yeah here's an email I got right you can see point two they're curious about whether or not robotics will continue to support once the current set of high schoolers graduate and move on that's another concern people have about it. They think, oh, high school is doing this for temporary things. And as you all can see, I graduated from high school. I, I got into my, my college of choice, got into my dream school, and I'm still doing this. So it's not, you have to prove to them that it's really not the case. So um, yeah, next slide. And then I usually like to uh, end this right here. I think, I think this is a very representative quote about it, entrepreneurship from someone that I really, uh, aspire to someone who's really a role model, Nelson Mandela. For those of you who are not familiar with him, he's a South African apartheid fighter. He fought for uh, years to gain um, independence and, and to get, break the racial segregation in South Africa. And I really like this quote. It says, I never lose. I either win or I learn. So every time you get a rejection, every time something does not go away the plan, don't think about it as you losing. Don't think about, oh, I missed out on something. You're learning. You're either winning or you're learning. And I think both of them are very positive. So uh, that's why I usually like to end my presentations about entrepreneurship because I think it's very reflective. When you're feeling down, people tell you that what you're doing is a waste of time. When you're feeling like, oh, this is this is not a good idea, to think about every experience you have, it's either you're either winning or you're learning. It's not it's neither you're not losing. Okay, and thank you for coming. And now I'm open to uh, questions. Great, thank you, Max, for your time in this really inspiring lecture. I'm sure that. Honestly, me and Emily, I'm sure we learned a lot from what you're um, telling us, and I'm sure our attendees are as well. So now we'll be accepting um, questions um, via the Q&A box, and I'll be asking them to Max. Um, okay. Do you want me to uh, look? Do you want me to re answer the questions in the Q&A first? Yeah, sure. Um, I have the questions pulled up right here, so I can ask them in person. Yeah. Go for Great. it. Okay, so from an anonymous attendee, does it look good if we literally state that we are excited or passionate about the uh, position? I wouldn't recommend it. You, you can show that you're excited. Why say it when you can show that you're excited, right? Like come into there, have a big smile, greet the interviewer. If it's in person, shake their hand. Really use your tone of voice to sound like you really want the position like you're doing right now. Like sound, sound like you want to be there. Like why? why say that you're excited when you can show it show don't tell so i mean if you have to say it fine but it just, it just sounds really cheesy oh i'm excited about this position it's okay to explain why you're excited like oh i really love teaching other people this sounds like but if, if it's something you're really passionate about in the tone of voice and, and your eye contact and, and how you talk and like i said like if you're going to be reading off a script and, and you're memorizing some stuff that's not going to sound very very good Right, just to add on to that, body language is kind of a big thing. I feel like um, that can definitely give you an advantage in showing how excited you are for the position. Okay. Yeah, I think I think in a virtual setting, it's a it's, it's a lot harder because I think that's why I say eye contact is especially important, and you can try to use your hands. I know that's a little bit harder in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in Zoom, but yeah, and, and when you and when you come in like. You don't want to be a slouch, like, especially especially in a person reader. You can see that you're slouching in a chair. Like, you know, put your feet flat on the floor, sit up tall, and it'll project your voice and sound like you really want to be there. Yeah, great. Okay, moving on to the next question from an anonymous attendee. In addition to a resume, should you also create a personal website? Um, I think the modern day personal website is LinkedIn. You should go just just use just get a LinkedIn. I mean, if you, you have to be 16 to get a LinkedIn. Get a LinkedIn. I think a LinkedIn is 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 what a lot of people told me is that it's a modern day resume. Yeah, it's okay to have a personal website, but honestly, all it can do is is highlight is all of, all a personal website and a resume and LinkedIn can do is highlight past experiences. Once you're once you're accepted, once once you go through the interview stage, the person is, is is trying to see like is this person like their communication skills and all those things that that are really a lot more important than what you actually say. Like when I look back on the interviewers and the interviews that went well. I don't remember what they said. I remember the impression they gave me. I remember how excited they sounded. I remember how enthusiastic they were. I remember kind of what they said. I mean, interviews that didn't go well, the ones that I remember, the ones that I think went, went horribly, and the ones that I, I, I couldn't contain my laughter afterward because of <laughs> how badly they went. 
the ones like I don't. It's not not because of what they said. It's, it's most of the times because you know they're either you know facing the other way or they're you know sounding really bored or things like that. So yeah, right. I mean, okay. It's okay. Yeah, it, it won't hurt. It won't. But I don't think I, I Google my my people that much. Right. For sure. Okay. Moving on. Um, does your organization raise funds to help low-income children get access to electronic devices? This is more about your robotics for all organization, Max. Did it cut off? At the moment, no. At the moment, okay. no. We, 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 we focused on teaching. At the moment, no, is my answer. We're, at the moment, we're focused on teaching. A lot of schools are already doing this. A lot of companies like Comcast and those like that are already, already doing that. So, yeah. Okay, um, now our next question is from Kaylee. Um, what is the best way to look for organizations for a sponsorship? Can you, can you, if you're Kaylee, if you're here, would you mind like saying like what, what you mean by sponsorship, like getting money or like, what do you mean by sponsorship? Like getting money, getting more publicity. What do you mean by sponsorship? If you wouldn't mind typing it in or I could, okay, getting money. I would, I would find organizations that have similar missions to you and find, find foundations, find things that people who support, support the cause that, that you're trying to go for. And it's a lot of, it's a lot about cold emailing. I think you guys had a cold emailing session, a cold, cold calling, cold emailing session before. I'm sure you learned in that session that a lot of it is about cold emailing. And unfortunately, sometimes it's just luck. Right. Okay, moving on. Um, what are your tips for getting more exposure of a team business on social media? Um, my, my, my tips would be probably to uh, more exposure. I'd just say, you know, advertise it more. Share your posts. Put it on your story. And then if, if, you're, if you're able to afford it, boost it. Facebook boosting has been a very uh, valuable, valuable experience. And Facebook boosting is not going to work if you spend 10 bucks. It's gonna work for, it's gonna only work if, if you're gonna spend $100, $200, $300. I and mean, when you do that, you wanna target people. Like let's say, like when, 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 when I was boosting your classes for elementary school students, it doesn't help me to boost it to kids my age. So nice thing about Facebook is that you can actually go in and you could say, you can target, like for us, like we targeted parents with kids, the age that we're looking for in their classes. Because how does it help if, if, if we advertise our classes to people who retired? They don't have kids who are currently our age. So Facebook is very powerful tool that way. Great. Um, another question from Kaylee is how do you register your organization to be a 501c3 nonprofit? That's a big question. I would recommend, um, it depends on the state. You first have to legally incorporate the, the organization within a state, whatever state you're in, and then you have to do it nationally. Um, the process is, is is too complex for me to say verbally. I'm, I'll type my email in the chat if you want to email me later. And, or um, you can also message me on LinkedIn. That also works for me on Facebook. It doesn't really matter. Um, you can email me there if you have more detailed, detailed questions about it. It's about a six month process. It costs about $500. So just uh, other than that, like the detailed legal paperwork, I think that's better if you just email me and we can just have a time to just discuss that. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, cool. Last question. What are your top tips for seniors doing college interviews? Yeah, I had, a, I had my fair share of college interviews last uh, year. Um, I, think, I think a lot of things I said today are very relevant. Look up, look, look up the college. Learn about why the college is, 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 is a good fit for you. And what do you mean good fit? Doesn't mean it have to be good fit for everyone else. All right, let's say you're applying to like, like well, let's say like Harvard. Don't say I want to go to Harvard because of the name. Who doesn't, who wouldn't want to go to Harvard because of that name? Find a reason that you really enjoy, something, something about the school that fits with you. Another, another, another bad thing to say is I like, I like, I like the, I like the um, location. Like for me, I, I think one of the biggest drawing factors for me was for Georgetown was, was the location. That's why it was one of the, my top schools was one of the, why it was the school I selected was because of location. But in the interview, I didn't, I didn't say like, oh, the location, because guess what? There are other schools in DC. If I just wanted to go there for a location, that's not a really good answer. So I would say like, um, explain like some certain programs or explain like, like I, the reason why I said Georgetown, my, my why Georgetown question, my answer was like, 
I really like how, how Georgetown has all these programs that really help connect me with the entrepreneurship world and connect me with the nonprofit world in DC and kind of things like that. So find something that, you know, really, really makes you fit with the school and don't, don't give you a generic question. And you really do research about the school. Don't ask questions that are generic. That's not a very good thing. Um, generic questions as in, what I mean by generic, generic question be like, oh, um, why, why do you like the school? That, that's a question to be asked anyway. Ask, ask a question like, let's say for, for um, like for school, like to say like, did, have you have participation with any like if like for I know I know Northwestern has a lot of like famous traditions. So for Northwestern, a good question would be like, what was your favorite of all those traditions? So same thing that you really know a lot about the school and, and really really explain to it like why each school has like I know as a senior it's kind of hard to differentiate the colleges, but you really have to think okay what makes each call unique and how can I target my questions for them. Yeah, great. Um, I think that'll be the end of all of our questions. Um, thank you again, Max, for your yep. time and speaking with uh, us and the attendees. Uh, we really appreciate the time and effort you put into this workshop. All right. Well, have a great day, everyone. Yeah, you too. And yep. Emily, would you like to just go over our last slide? Yeah. So, um, hi, guys. Just to close this off, um, thank you guys for coming to our three-day camp. And please follow the feedback form that I put the link um, on the board is um, tinyurl.com slash three day camp feedback. Um, if you want the Zoom recording for all of um, three of our workshops, the Zoom recording will also be available on our YouTube channel, but that's going to be later. So if you want early access, we'll be sending out the Zoom recordings um, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. And also please consider um, supporting us by buying our merch. Um, I also put the link here and all the profits going to low income communities, pub public speaking and political education. And thank you, Max, again, for being the guest speaker for our workshop. Um, but yeah, I uh, hope you all have a good day. Yeah, just to add on to that, um, the feedback form takes only one to two minutes um, to fill out and it gives us um, adequate feedback so we know where to improve for future workshops. And this is all for you guys, so make sure to fill it out. Um, we will be sending the Zoom recording links um, 48 hours after you fill it out. So the sooner you do it, the sooner you get the links. Thank you. Cool. Okay. I'll see um, everyone. Thank you so much for attending again, Max. Thank you. And uh, we hope to talk to everyone soon. Yeah. And um, I'll also send out an email right now about the feedback form. So if you want to just take a screenshot of the slideshow or I'll send out the email right now. So great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you guys again. Bye.